Hello there, everyone. So my name is Alex, um, Handmade by Alex. You may have seen me on YouTube. If not, please do uh, give me a like and subscribe. You've got to get that bit in. Um, so just to give you a bit of an introduction about myself, I've been working with leather for about seven and a half years. Started off after having a reconstructive hip surgery that I needed to do something to keep my mind and body occupied. A lot of people get into leather work because of recovery. Same with myself. I managed to turn that hobby into a business. With that, I then turned it into a full-time job for a leather working company called Tandy Leather. They were at Maker Central for the first and second years. So some of you may have seen me there hammering away and doing the demos and things as well. With that role, I got to travel across the world, working with different leather, t different types of leather workers. So saddle makers, costume departments, uh, bad bag makers, accessory makers, people that make wallets, people that make belts, people that make bridles and saddles, and all these really exciting things. Which was great for me, because it meant I got to learn from all of these dis different people. So let's talk about leather. How many people here are wearing leather shoes? So the first pair of leather sandals have been proven to uh, have been made 10,000 years ago. The earliest pair of closed toe leather shoes, five and a half thousand years ago. And even with all the modern technology we've got, we're all still sat here with a bit of dead cow lashed to our feet with a bit of cord because leather lasts. And we know that. So if we look at leather usage over the history of man throughout time, as soon as we figured out that we could make an edged tool, knife, cutty, we realized that the animals that we've been killing and eating, we can utilize their hides. We can use that skin. So what we did, we started to cut the leather off stuff. And then what we realized we could do is make shelter. We've got a bit of shelter that's going to protect us from the wind. We're now starting to evolve. We can use the leather for the tools that we've made. We can bind the blades to a handle. And now we've got a bigger, better tool, which is great. Then what we learned how to do is preserve the leather. So we go from having something with hair on it. By the way, this isn't really leopard. This is cow. But you come feel it, we'll, we'll do some touchy-feely stuff, and I've got plenty of leather at the stand as well. But we realized that we could preserve the leather. So we can take that off, we can turn it into something like this. Much more durable, stops it from decomposing, stops it from smelling, which is great. Um, and if you look at some of the early dig sites as well, a lot of the early items that were made were pouches. And a pouch is really useful, because if you're caveman, You've got your bit of leather tied to your foot, and you want to go and explore somewhere over there. But you've got no way of carrying your supplies. So we can see leather pouches from thousands of years ago that still have remnants of berries and foodstuffs in them, or basic tools, you know, your flints in there, your edged tool as well, where somebody's gone on a long journey. They've used the leather to help them achieve that. I mean, they've died, but that happens to everybody. Um, and then sort of moving forward from there as well, we look at when we domesticated animals. So you think about a horse. Well, it's, it'll have a, a headstock on it. It'll have a saddle on it. We put saddle bags on it, which means we can go further using that for longer because we can carry supplies with us. Then if we look at human warfare, leather, when it gets wet, find you a bit, soft, supple, when it goes wet, it hardens. And then what we realized is that's quite a good defense mechanism. You think about the samurais. They had water hardened, decorated, painted, dyed armor, which for the weapons of the time was fantastic. It'll deflect a, uh, an arrow. 
it might slow a sword down a little bit, but it's better than it hitting you. So leather, essentially, is the original PPE. I've just thought that's quite, that's quite interesting, that one. Um, and then when we moved on to sort of plate armor, we'd use leather for undergarments and also to attach the plates to us. So it never really lost where it was going. It's always been a very useful material. Then if we start to look at the Industrial Revolution, Yes, I'm getting into one of these lecture bits now. It's not a talk, it is a lecture, but thank you all for sitting here. Um, leather was relied on a lot. We start to look at working gloves, working boots, and most importantly, the straps that were used from a main shaft in a mill and a factory to run the machines underneath. Strong, durable, easily replaceable, sustainable. So to, to look at how it's progressed and helped humans to progress and evolve, we're still using it today. So, what is leather? So the definition of leather is a strong, flexible and durable material obtained from the tanning or chemical treatment of animal skins and hides to prevent de decay. I did just read that off Wikipedia. Um, so what that means is exactly what we've just been talking about. Being able to process a raw material down to something which is more useful and usable for us. We look at tanning, the different types of tanning. We can use chemical tanning. So when you do something which is chemically tanned, it's much quicker and it gives you stuff like this. So this is a bit of a cow. This would have been tanned and preserved in maybe a week, dyed blue, sent off. This is horse, of course. This would have taken six to eight months. A little bit nicer. And then this is a vegetable tanned piece. So not really any chemicals used, so bark tanned, natural, much more flexible, much more, it's got much more strength to it. And these are the sorts of things that you can, you can carve into, you can dye it whatever color you want. That's what we use these bits for. So with the finished leathers, we can see that they can be changed into different colors. Some people like this. It has a use and a purpose, but you don't often see this color cow wandering around the, the fields and the farms. Um, yeah, fine, I, does a job, absolutely does a job there. So we've got vegetable tanning, we've got chrome tanning or chemical tanning, the last tanning that we have, there are a couple of others, but the one that I like to talk about is brain tanning. So if you've got an animal, we've got our cow, we've killed it, we've made some meat, we can use the emulsified oils of the animal's brain, along with some of the really disgusting, naturally occurring chemicals. Wee wee, wee wee, this in here, bit of wee. Mix it all up and that will help to preserve the flesh. Um, it's very, very labor intensive. It stinks because it's got brains and wee in it, but you can do it at home in a bathtub. So if anybody does make some, send me some pictures, but I don't want to touch it. Um, so we're looking at the different, so that's the different tanning processes. Then what we want to look at is the finishes. So we've seen on here, we've got, this was a hairy cow, being bleached, shaven, and then dyed. <sighs> Can't, I can't even, it's just horrendous stuff. And then things like this, which have just been left natural. So different leathers have different names, and we might see there's different names. So you get real leather. Real leather is what we want. We want a piece of something which has come straight from the animal. We get split leathers, something like this, like a suede. That's all right, it's good. So you've got the top part of the, if this is the whole flesh, the top part is your top grain or full grain. The next bit down when it gets split is your split leathers, like your suede. The next type we get is genuine leather. Everybody's seen something, you'll see a wallet on holiday and it'll say genuine leather on it. You'll see the, the belt in Asda and you go, oh, I can buy some trousers for four pounds and I can buy a belt for two pounds. Genuine leather. Let's put that into terms that hopefully you guys will be able to understand a little bit more. Real leather is a plank of wood. Genuine leather is MDF. 
So when you've got your big bit of leather that's been split and cut and you've got all the, the sawdust, the leather dust and the scraps, if you put that into a blender, get a load of glue, mush it together, you can get something that will look like that. Because there's a fiber mesh that's been in this as well. It's seen an animal at some point in its life. Kind of. It's not an animal. It kind of was at one point. That's your MDF. Whereas something like these bits on here, you know, something like that, that is the top part of the animal. Previous to this, it would have had the hair on here. That's the bit that we like. Yes, as we know with MDF and real wood, MDF has its place. Genuine leather has its place. But making wallets and belts out of it, the belt made from genuine leather is going to crack, is going to peel, is going to split, and you are going to be mad at it. Whereas one made from real leather is going to last a lifetime. I don't like the genuine leather thing, by the way. I don't know if you can tell. It's very much a marketing term. So um, I mentioned sustainability earlier. So nearly all leather is a byproduct of the meat industry. It's one of the oldest forms of upcycling or recycling. And there are some leathers, which are some animals which are bred for the leather. I tend not to use any of those. Uh, so cattle makes up about 90%. So if you think about the meat industry, anything that's waste at the end of that gets upcycled. Otherwise, it goes straight into a landfill, which we don't want. So if you think about things that would use leather, you've got the upholstery industry for cars, shoes, as we've already touched on, uh, clothing, and then furniture. But still only there, we're only taking about 30% of what would be going into a landfill. So what I'm saying is more people should take up leather work to save the planet. Does that work, anybody? Yeah, a couple of people, good. So if you're here today, it's assumed you've got an interest in resistive materials, because we've got woodworkers, we've got metal workers, we've got lots of noises. Um, and, and you might like the traditional skills, such as leather work. There's a good chance that the skills that you've already got are very transferable into leather work. So do you have something where you can make a mess? Have you got a cutting table? Have you got you know, an old kitchen workbench, probably? A cutting mat on a dining table, yeah, probably. Do you have a straight edge? Yeah. Do you have a tool to cut with? Yeah. Do you need any of these fancy tools that we've got? Not straight away. I would recommend that everybody try and get hold of one of these. Plug, plug, plug. And anybody here with a maker knife? Yeah, we've got a couple. Yeah, good lads. Um, but there are other utility knives available. But just a, a basic utility knife and a straight edge, I'll just use a normal utility knife, will cut through most of the leathers that you're looking at. You can also do things like using a rotary knife, rotary cutter. A lot of us may already have one of these, fairly inexpensive. For the thinner leathers that you're going to be cutting through, perfect, roll it straight down. Leather shears, quite expensive for what they are, but heavy duty shears which will cut through most thicknesses. They're great to use as well. We can look at something like the Japanese skiving knife, which you might be able to find. Uh, this was about 15 pounds from Amazon. It does a job, it will cut. But for most of us, we've probably already got a cutting mat, a straight edge, and a utility knife. That's all you really need to get started. The other thing to look at would be, if you don't want to go down hand sewing, we can look at riveting. If you can hammer a nail reasonably straight, you can rivet some leather together. All you need to do is punch a hole. A couple of ways you can do it. A rotary hole punch, like this. Or just a standard, I've got one here, a big old hole punch, which would just strike straight onto. Very inexpensive. You might already have something that will do the same sort of job. Just sat at home. Put these back. And then it's just a case of setting a rivet. Loads of different ways to set rivets, loads of different types of rivets. 
We've got some, I'll, if you want to come down to the stand afterwards, we'll go through and I'll show you some really simple rivet setting techniques. Very, very easy tools. There's plenty of videos online. Go check out the, uh, go check out my website and go check out the YouTube channel as well. And sort of that's it in the, we're going to cut something. We've got a big bit of something. We're going to cut it, make it smaller. And with a lot of good luck and practice, we're going to make it prettier and useful which is all we really do. We look at a tree, we chop it down, we make wood, we turn it into a table. Same sort of thing with leather. We look at a whole hide, look at a piece of a cow, we're gonna chop it down, we're gonna turn it into some leather. So that being said, what I have started to do already is something that all of us could use. I'm wearing one right now. It's not a hat. Is. I'm going to take this big old piece of leather and over the weekend, we're going to turn this into an apron and we're going to give it away. So there's the Maker Central raffle. So if you make sure that you've got your raffle tickets, we'll be giving this apron away. So that's it for this so far. Anybody, any questions? trying to get into leatherworking not really knowing anything about it um, where would you suggest starting very good question um, YouTube as most of us will know is a great place to start the best way to start is to have an idea of what you'd like to make so find the need and then work backwards so if you're thinking I need a new belt okay belt is what you want to do let's work backwards and work downwards from that so what you then need to learn how to do is cut some leather you can do it by hand you can use uh, strap cutting tools which is probably one on here somewhere so this essentially is a, a strap cutter a bladey bit rulery bit pull it that'll make you a belt you can then simply punch some holes put a buckle on it and rivet it together and you've got a belt you want to make a wallet, you want to make something for a knife sheath. Knife sheaths are really, really popular for tool covers. Decide what it is you want to make, work backwards. Okay, so I need to, you look at this and you go, actually what I need to be able to do is I need to be able to turn a piece of leather over and stitch it together. Let's learn at doing some, look at doing some stitching, learning some stitching. A lot of my patterns, if not all of them, you can get the, the pattern itself free to download off the website, and there'll be a build along video as well. And there are a lot of other YouTubers that do very similar things. Just give it a go. Uh, the next question a lot of people ask, which hopefully I'm not going to overcut somebody, is where to get the tools and materials from. There are links on the website um, in the UK. So a lot of this stuff today is being provided by Lion Leathers in Northampton. There's another company called Abbey England who specialize in saddlery tools, but also a lot of generic cross-craft and leatherworking tools as well. Amazon is your friend, eBay is your friend. If anybody is wanting to look more into this and they're really, really getting stuck, there's a list of basic tools on the website. Just have a look. And if you get really stuck, drop me a message, leave a comment, and we can have a, a communication that way. Enthusiasm, by the way, love the enthusiasm. And you kind of did kind of cut my legs from under me there because I was going to ask you about stitching and about whether leather sewing machines, whether they're hand cranked or otherwise, I don't know anything about it, but how do you get such, presumably you have to make holes very precisely first before you put whatever kind of twine or thread. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about yep. um, that. So hand sewing leather um, is completely different to machine stitching leather. So a hand stitch for leather is something used, that we would use traditionally is called a saddle stitch. And a saddle stitch is one piece of leather, don't you pick this up, is one piece of uh, thread with a needle on each side. And what you do is you punch your holes first using something like this. See that there? Uh, so this is a diamond stitching chisel. They come in different spaces and uh, the amount of teeth and things as well. And what you'll do is you'll hammer this through using a nice big heavy maul 
hammer this through the leather, and the aim is to get it through all of the pieces. So on something like this, for example, I'll put some glue around the edge, wait for it to set, ish, and then hammer straight through so the teeth go all the way through. Then I'll use something like this, probably this one, which is a stitching pony. So this one was made for me by uh, an old customer. A lot of you woodworkers might be looking at this going, that's terrible, look at the state of that, what's going on with that? Brilliant, that means I want you to go make one. Uh, but we we'll use something like this. And we'll clamp the work in. Uh, stitching pony, stitching horse. Sometimes it's called a third hand because what you'd do is you'd sit on it. <laughs> like this. But you'd be sat on it. You wouldn't have a table, but I'm not going to do a squat on the stage. And then you can hand sew. So one thread, needle on each side, and you're passing through the holes that you've already made. When it comes to actually sewing the leather, we use... Hopefully we can see this. So this is a blunt needle. You see, there's not really a... If I just stab myself with that, there's nothing because it's a blunt needle. So we don't need sharp needles for leather work. Asterix, I'll come back to that. Because we've already made the holes. If you're doing something um, with really, really soft leather, so I've got some deer hide on the skin that you can have a look at and feel, which would normally be used for gloves. So you'd use a glover's needle, which are very sharp. Uh, so you don't punch the holes first with that. When it does come to doing the hand sewing, it takes time. It takes time to get it neat. It takes time to get your line straight. And you will fail. Absolutely. You'll punch the holes and you'll go, it's not going to work. You might punch it too close to the edge and it ruins. You might punch it too far into the work and it's not practical for what you want to do anymore. We've all been there. I've got a fantastic piece of rubbish work on the stand that I look at it and go, you did that. This is your business. This is what you do. You, and you did that. Yeah, because we all start somewhere. Uh, but yeah, we can come and have a look. And if anybody wants to see some hand sewing, I'll be doing some hand sewing over the, the weekend as well. Um, what we'd like to say is a lot of people here already have been across to the stand and we've done so many demonstrations and it is fantastic to see more people wanting to get into this. Is that right for you? Brill. Yeah, one more. Uh, un unlike wood, which has got a grain, is there any certain way you have to cut leather? Good question. So wood has a grain leather? Not really. Um, some of these finished pieces... Can we zoom in on that? We zoomed in. Yeah, so hopefully on this you can see there is a slight, see the, the straight markings to it here. Yeah, can we see that? So if we look at that compared to, i get in the same spot, a bit of horse, this is all over. Whereas that, there is, like I said, this has been fixed with um, like a fiber mesh. But in general, nah, cut it whichever way you want, doesn't really matter. So where leather does um, sort of cross over with wood as opposed to a fabric. So with a fabric, if you put a hole in the wrong place, it's quite recoverable. With wood, if you put a hole in the wrong place, you put a hole in the wrong place. Some leathers are quite forgiving. This one, quite forgiving. If you stick a hole in the side of this, you've got a hole in it. So that's where there's a bit of a, a crossover there. Is that okay? Yeah. Any more? Hey, yeah. One second, just come across with the microphone. Hi. Um, can I ask, you know, with some of the tooling and techniques, uh, crossing over to different leather crafts, such as book binding, shoemaking, how transferable would you say the skills and tools are, or is it just a completely different bag of fish? Uh, no. So. The skills are very much transferable. This is what we want to look at, sort of cross-crafting, um, transferable skills. Can you punch some holes and can you glue something down? Can you cut a straight line? All these sorts of things. Yes, so very much transferable. Um, things like this was actually, so I designed it, but laser cut and then laser engraved, because a lot of people get into the lasers now. So you can do that with it as well. 
when you look at so shoemaking, um, cord weighings is a very, very specialist thing. I've made one boot once, and it was only a right boot, and it is difficult. And I've got a left glove. If anybody wants to get into glove making, don't. Very difficult. Um, so yes, as long as you've got you know a, a bit of sort of base knowledge, you already know how to use the tools, how to hit something and cut something in a straight line, then you should be absolutely fine with it. Any more? We done? Great stuff. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you soon. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to see more leatherworking tips, tricks, and build-alongs, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that bell icon to be notified when new videos go live.